Good morning, Sometimes everyone. it's hard to be humble. <laughs> yeah. right. Welcome to the first day of the Appalachian Justice Symposium put on by the West Virginia Law Review. We're all really excited about this, and we're really excited to have you all here. Uh, and we're just going to jump right into it. Uh, so our first panel today is on rural veterans. More than 21 million American veterans face serious challenges, including unemployment, chronic health problems, and homelessness. According to a count on a single night in January 2015, nearly 48,000 veterans were experiencing homelessness. Veterans face issues such as poverty, lack of support from family or friends, substance abuse, or mental health challenges that may develop or worsen as a result of trauma they experience while serving. Compounding these issues, the service branches have discharged thousands of veterans with bad paper discharges, like other than honorable discharge or bad conduct discharge, uh, which often stem uh, from service-related trauma. Bad paper discharges uh, generally render one ineligible to receive VA benefits, which includes housing and health care benefits, as well as intense stigma and lifelong barriers to employment. This panel intends to provoke a meaningful discussion regarding the effective delivery of holistic, interdisciplinary legal and social services to rural veterans to generate feedback on veteran rural access to justice initiatives in other states and other suggestions for community collaborations for veteran access to justice projects. Jennifer Oliva will be our moderator today. Well, I accept. <laughs> behave myself because the, the tape recorder is on. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, we have a wonderful panel here today of people who have, I don't even know how many combined years of either service and or uh, service to veterans. Um, so we have a wonderful panel. I'm going to do this. I'm going to briefly introduce folks and let them get right up here and, and get it going. And I promise you at the end you'll have plenty of time for questions. So try to formulate and think of really good questions to ask these people um, why we happen to have them here uh, and give them a warm West Virginia welcome after each of my introductions, okay? Thank you. First up, Mr. Richardson. Jim Richardson it got his JD at the University of Maryland. He is the chair of the Veterans and Military Law Section of the Federal Bar Association. He previously served as president of that organization. He has a long history of involvement with Veterans and Military Affairs. <clears throat> Very impressively, he served a combat tour as a Marine Corps field artillery officer in the Army. We call that big guns, all right? <laughs> Uh, and um, as in Garrison as a judge advocate in the Marines. Uh, following active duty, he was the head of the discharge review section of the Board of Correction Naval Records and was also senior attorney advisor in the United States Court of Appeals for Armed Forces. Uh, Mr. Richardson presently provides pro bono legal services to veterans in the Baltimore, Washington area. He's amazing. Thank you for being here, and he's agreed to lead this off for us today. Thank you, guys. First thing. I want to do is show you a little film clip um, from sometime in early 2013 until 2016. I was involved with Maryland Public Television in producing a documentary about Maryland veterans who served in Vietnam. We interviewed something like 300 vets. Uh, we ended up with roughly 100 people in the uh, in the film. It's shown here on Maryland Public Television. You can. You can watch it by going online. Uh, there's three hours. Don't try to watch all three hours at once. It's a little too intense. Uh, but I'm going to show you a rural veteran. This is a uh, way the board around landed. Um, it blew my left leg completely off. And um, my right leg was severely just neat and hanging together. Um, my right hand was severed almost completely off. And I had shrapnel um, in arms, legs, chest, back, neck, spinal cord, and I was paralyzed um, from the neck down. You gotta remember, I was 18 years old. I was gonna play baseball. I was gonna be a performer. I was gonna get married. I was gonna have a home and, and job and everything. It was gone. I was. I'm not going to be a you know, normal society. I can't even wipe my own ass. I can't feed myself. I can't do anything. And, and I was trained to kill with my hands, and I was so freaking disabled, I couldn't even kill myself. Get a little emotional to see that. 
The good side is, Ed came back. There's another point in the film, you'll see him doing a handstand on a parallel bar. So this is a guy who survived, who did really well. I uh, am amazed at what these veterans can do. We're going to talk a little bit about how you can help folks who don't live in the reasonable proximity to all the good medical care that Bed got. You know, he was 30 miles from two different VA regional medical facilities who could help him, who could provide resources, who could provide physical therapy. I grew up in a little village on Maryland's eastern shore. About 400 when I left to go to high college. It has about 320 now. It's almost 100 miles, two hours from Baltimore to a regional med center. It's about the same distance to Washington. These folks get lost. I want to open up. Here's a picture of Appalachia. Got a question for you. When I do these tunes for two hours, train people to uh, discharge upgrades or play a little game called Take the Jar, Get Some Money, I'm going to shorten it to one question today. I have here a genuine brass plated dollar. If anyone can tell me what state suffered the highest per capita KI rate during Vietnam? West Virginia? Yep. <laughs> My people. <laughs> My people. Yeah, we're all gone. <laughs> yeah. What you see there, the numbers indicate the number of folks who were killed in action in Vietnam. 21%. When I first did this slide, I excluded Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina, and also Mississippi. At that point, we had 21% of the KIA casualties in Vietnam were from Appalachia. <coughs> Next slide. Yes, sir. Or give me the clicker one, yeah, I don't care. I went back in and added, which one do I press when they're all different? It goes forward, uh, forward, backwards, right forward. Okay. Whoops. Went back in and added, uh, and took a look at the casualties and where they were from. I had excluded them originally because of the high military presence of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Also excluded Georgia because of Atlanta. When I added them, 28% of the KIAs from Vietnam were in Appalachia. Now, we don't have Go forward, Iran, Iraq, 12%. We may have 12% in this when you add all the counties. So what we're seeing is we're seeing folks in these areas, in this area, serve in numbers far disproportionate to their percentage of the population in the United States. So Abraham Lincoln said it best. You've probably seen this or heard this. Care for him who has borne the battle and his widow and his all. That's actually written in something in D.C. called a pension bill. It was the original, quote, VA, if you will. In the in the uh, in the but that's the point. So who is a veteran? Oh, there's Georgie Patton. <laughs> <All right. laughs> a veteran is actually a uh, legal definition. 38 U.S.C. 101, sub 2. A person who has served in the active military. The problem here is those last three letters, last three words, whose service was other than dishonorable. And that causes a lot of confusion. <coughs> you will hear a lot of folks say, well, I or he, she has a dishonorable discharge. Chances are it isn't. Dishonorable discharge is only the product of the sentence of the general court martial. And it's supposed to be reserved for people that have committed serious felonies. So you have a lot of people who are separated with discharges which the VA considers, quote, other than honorable, who don't have dishonorable discharges. The bad paper problem. The USS New Jersey. Hmm. Great story. The New Jersey got its name from Franklin Roosevelt 
It was his thank you to the governor of New Jersey for making sure that he got elected in 1940. Uh, it was originally supposed to have been the South Dakota. South Dakota, the USS South Dakota has a, has a, I'm sorry, Montana, has a bad history. Three times the keel has been laid down and even the hull built and it has been scrapped. Okay, so what kind of discharges that are just characterized as under condition of dishonor? And other than honorable discharge, if you're dealing with an older veteran, she or he may say they have an undesirable discharge. Mm -hmm. If you go back even further, although I don't know that we have that many World War II era veterans, you may hear somebody talking about a blue discharge. It was actually printed on blue paper. Right they have a bad conduct <laughs> discharge, which on the DD-214, which is the document they give you to leave the service, is characterized as other than honorable. And then you have a dishonorable discharge, as I said. That's the positive sentence that's going on for a sure. There is a certain amount of controversy about those two, and also the dismissal, which is judged against all officers. Uh, we're the only country in the world that imposes discharge as part of the sentence of court martial. It has been proposed a number of times to do away with it. We inherited it from the British when we create when we borrow their when we adopted their articles of war and their articles for the government of the uh, 200 years, we're still doing it. I'll leave it to you to figure that out. The problem for rural veterans, big issue is they don't have any information. They don't know. All they know is they've been somewhere to the VA or somebody's told them, we can't give you vet veterans benefits. They go, Two, lack of asset excess and advice to the review process. While the vet on his or her way out is supposed <coughs> to be advised of a number of options once she or he leaves the service about having that discharge change, they either aren't listening, aren't told, or they're simply given a piece of paper. Uh, any number of those options. Two. Few of the VS veteran service officers really understand the process. They don't even know anything about it. Three, most attorneys, even those with experience, assume that it's the same as a VA. They can't be compensated. Cost of private counsel for one of these things is about 2K. That's based on lawyers <coughs> in my neck of the woods on the eastern shore of Maryland. In fact, it probably takes about 10 hours to do one of these. Stick with the discharge itself. During my tenure as head of the Discharge Review Board, I probably processed 12, 14 cases where people came up to be buried in a veteran's cemetery and were told no. They had never told their friends and neighbors that they had a bad piece of paper. A uh, certain amount of intransigence by the Department of Veterans you go there, you present your DD-214, they look on it, they see other than honorable, and they say, sorry son, we can't help you. They're not supposed to do that, they're supposed to counsel them and advise them that within the VA itself, you can't have a review. It's too easy, you know, I once described the VA as being like a small town post office, you know, one where you go up and get your mail. Everybody, come here, okay, okay. If it slides in the box, you're fine. If it hits any of the wooden periods, <laughs> okay, first issue, first place. The, date, the state service has a discharge review board. This is, this is set by statute. There are four, the Army, the Naval Service, the Air Force, and the Coast Guard. Uh, you can go there if you have 15 years. You, there's two shots. You get a record review. You got a, an actual oral oral Service Correction Boards, again, there are four. These folks are civilians in the department concerned. They may or may not have military experience, but they know a lot about the military. Theoretically, you're supposed to apply within three years. Reality is they don't care. They don't care. The oldest enlisted discharge I reviewed was 1879. The oldest officer dismissal I reviewed was the Civil War. Okay, let's talk a minute about post-traumatic stress disorder. That's a big issue these days. This is right out of the DSM. 
worry about it. It's in your material. If you have a client and you think maybe issued or there's been a diagnosis of PTSD, go to the diagnostic statistical manual and look at it. The boards want to see a, a PTSD case and they are regular. They want to see it laid out just the same way you would do a, a final argument in a trial. The elements, the evidence. All right. In uh, 2015, <coughs> Secretary of Defense issued a memorandum that was followed up two years later, I mean, 2015, and then it was followed up two years later by another memo directing these boards to give special consideration to soldiers, sailors, airmen, and Marines who are suffering with PTSD and with whom there's a nexus between their, that, that issue and the um, misconduct which led to the discharge. Uh, did nothing did anything for a while, and finally Margaret Milton and Mike Quishney and Gene Fidel and some other folks up in the Ivy Leagues, always the Ivy Leagues, sued them yeah. and said, you guys aren't doing what you've been told to do by the Secretary of Defense. Rattle around, rattle around. There was a settlement in return for re taking a special look at these things. They were required to make reports. <coughs> this is what it looks like today. The blue <coughs> bars represent the numbers of cases where people have applied for discharge upgrades, citing post-traumatic stress, post stress disorder and or traumatic brain injuries as being part of the root cause. I have four cases pending. I have all but one have some variation. That's what 2016 looks like. Um, need a new battery. Oh, that's what 2000, <laughs> that looks like. 2017. Okay. I don't know what happened to this next slide. Oh, here we go. Here's the big myth. This has been percolating around. Ever. Big. Ever. <laughs> it even showed up in, a, in an episode of Bones. Uh, <laughs> uh, Seeley's brother, you may remember, was a Navy SEAL. He gets in some trouble and gets kicked out with a dismissal. They're sitting in a bar talking about it, and he says, oh, it's no big deal in six months of the jump. <laughs> Not right. My first client, 1978. I'm still looking for him. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yep. By the way, okay. he and I know each other, so if I'm not bad. <laughs> We've been dealing with, David and I have been dealing with this problem since the early 80s. When I became head of the discharge review board, at one point, you, weren't you working as secretary of the Navy at one point? No, I was actually on the board. I got to make decisions. <laughs> yeah, you got to make the decisions. All right. Mythology again, good conduct after discharge warrants an automatic upgrade. No, it can be a factor. And in fact, if you have good, a, a, a member with good conduct, Good citizen, you can rally, rally that sort of evidence up and submit it. It may or may not make a difference. Three, bad paper is generally ignored by a lawyer because everyone knows the system is unfair. Not in Appalachia, they don't. This is still a place where putting on the flag and waving it is a big deal. I mean, it's got these bad paper. In fact, in most rural weather, you got issues. My records were lost in the St. Louis Center Fair. <laughs> fire. There's some truth to this. The National Military Personnel Records Center is a big warehouse in the mid 70s. 1973. It was a fire. <laughs> Guess what? The sprinkler system worked. Not that many records were destroyed by the fire, but tons of them were gummed together by the sprinkler system. <laughs> Second, it only applies to the record from the United States Army and the old Army Air Corps. Most of the Naval Service records are still there. Okay, I have a pardon. In the early 80s, it was a, it was a popular thing for folks with nothing but time on their hands except staring at 
green painted walls and bars. It's a right to the pardon attorney of the United States. Parole boards know instinctively that a prisoner released with bad paper is not going to have an easy time getting a job. So they would come, they would go to the, get a pardon, and come back to the correction board and ask for the discharge to be upgraded. Problem is, a pardon doesn't mean your discharge is upgraded. It is, quote, a sign of present forgiveness for prior misconduct. Doesn't change the character of service. Okay, I leave you with this thought. Wisdom of one of our great commanders of the 20th century. A Marine should be sworn to the patient endurance of hardships like the ancient knights. And it's not the least of these hardships to have to serve the Commander, are you, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, next up we have Commander David Myers, who's already sort of introduced himself to you. Um, I just want to say a few things about him. Um, he served as an enlisted sailor as well, uh, up to the rank of commander and was in the Navy JAG and did all sorts of fancy stuff. Um, he joined the Veterans Consortium Pro Bono Program as Deputy Director for Case Evaluation when he um, retired from service. Um, he was also Interim Director of that organization. Um, for several, how long, Dave, were you interim director? I know you were. I was acting director for about nine months. Okay, nine months. But more importantly, and I want you to know this, is that of his own volition and for with no cost at all to WVU or the state of West Virginia, when I first started this job, Dave volunteered to come here and put on a boot camp for my students and train people. Um, they have supported us financially in the clinic, and he came again this August. He literally just gets in his car and drives here and comes and trains students to represent veterans pro bono and he does it just because he's got a huge heart and he's just an awesome human being so personal thanks to you and thank you for yet again driving to west virginia just because i asked every trip has been a pleasure <laughs> <laughs> except the one where it snowed but other than that, <laughs> uh, i've got two parts today the first one when uh, janet uh, gave me a call about or sent me an email regarding the urban uh, the rural uh, veteran uh, i immediately came to mind an initiative involving John Marshall um, up in Chicago and Southern Illinois University in uh, down in Carbondale, Illinois, down the southern part of the state. And uh, since we had made donations to both schools to help this program along, I uh, got in touch with Marty Parsons at Southern and uh, Brian Klaus at Chicago and said, hey, can I carry the flag out to uh, out to uh, West Virginia and, and talk about this. Uh, I, West Virginia does not have a Chicago, <laughs> um, but uh, it's it's more a, a sharing of ideas about how different people can interact and what the benefit is to the rural, um, uh, to the rural veteran. Now, a quick background check here. I grew up on the northern, uh, the Marty's. Um, area is the southern 15 <coughs> counties in, Illinois, in southern Illinois. I can describe those to you very quickly. I grew up on that northern edge of, of that, uh, that county. If you just take West Virginia and you kind of squeeze it down so that the mountains are now just big hills and the deep valleys are kind of shallow valleys and the rivers that run through it are just creeks. Uh, that's pretty much Southern Illinois. <laughs> we have coal, we have oil, and here and there we have some of the most god-awful bad soil trying to grow corn as you can imagine. So that's where I grew up, that's where my friends are from, and there's one more Southern Illinois that I have to mention. His name is James T. Randolph, he was a signalman chief, and I got to boot camp and this salty guy stands up and says, my name is Signalman Chief James C. Randolph. I'm from Alto Pass, Illinois. Uh, all 375 people there in Alto Pass, Illinois. And I said, Signalman Chief, did you ever play basketball for the Alto Pass Apaches? <laughs> which is a high school team. So I was starting forward for three years. Boot camp just greased through after that. <laughs> Absolutely no problem. And sadly, uh, I found out through an odd series of events that Signalman Chief uh, 
Randolph uh, retired and passed away uh, about four or five years ago and is buried in the Veterans Cemetery there in Southern Illinois. So um, you come back. You do come back. Um, but the kids are the same, except for maybe a different kind of accent to kids from West Virginia. And they are kids. They're 18, 19, 20 years old. And the kids, Southern Illinois and West Virginia, are pretty much the same. As Jim mentioned, patriotic. And let's also mention it's a great place to get away from coal dust and a bad economy and to see the world. But where you come in is where you, you come back and that young man, 30, 35 year old young man who served his country or, or she did, and they've got that cough. And it's not black lung, it's Agent Orange, it's asbestos, it's burn pits. And they're sitting there going, why do I have this? And that's where you have to step in with the benefits and with the other issues. And it doesn't matter if you're down there in Alto <laughs> Pass or if you're in some small town in West Virginia, some wide spot in the road between two beautiful mountains. That's where you come in. That's where this fits. So I'm going to share this with you here very quickly and talk about the, um, uh, some of the ideas. Now, the numbers, uh, there are 401,000 plus veterans in northeastern Illinois. Of those, 39,000 are classified as disabled. Uh, there are 28,000 veterans who reside in 15 <coughs> southern Illinois counties, and about 4,500 are disabled. So the numbers are not what we're talking about. But um, uh, both schools do the same thing. Now, Marshall has been in business for years. It's one of the flagship veterans law clinics. Uh, Marty Parsons, former Marine, uh, just bringing a whole lot of energy to the, to the program. <coughs> He's got about, now as of the start of this year, he's got about a dozen lawyers and they are working hard and, and reaching out. Um, Chicago, Marshall opened uh, 268 cases. Marty has had about 45 so far, and, but he's, he's working, it's growing, and there's a couple things that I'll get to in just a second that, that we'll talk about. Um, his initial work, course has been uh, focusing on local service officers and the interaction between these two schools because both these folks are are working very hard at what they do. Uh, uh, John Marshall sent a couple of working trips to Southern Illinois to help get things started. Uh, they are planning CLEs for uh, Southern Illinois attorneys. Uh, uh, another quick small world story, I was down at Southern with a training program and I ran into uh, Sadly, the children of two of my high school classmates who had become attorneys there uh, in, my, in my little town of Centralia. So, um, and uh, that made me feel old, among other things. <laughs> um, Marty visited John Marshall in November 2016 to discuss the cooperative relationship. Um, uh, the Legal Initiative Partnership is continuing to grow. Uh, I understand that they, Marshall's going to send a, a small group down to Southern uh, to sort of observe the problems uh, with rural areas because there are still, hard to believe though it may be, some rural areas out around the suburbs. Uh, somebody once suggested Chicago suburbs are called Iowa, but uh, <laughs> uh, we'll leave that to you guys to sort out. Uh, advocate teams, uh, they discuss their experiences, there's an exchange of ideas. Uh, it has been noted that one of the big problems that Southern Illinois has that Chicago doesn't is transportation. Jim Mintz touched on it and getting the people. There's one VA hospital in Southern Illinois at Marion. It's right next to the Pete Rose Memorial Prison. Um, does anybody know who Pete Rose is? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So yeah, but you're up here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody in the audience. No. <laughs> okay. Um, and, uh, the advocate teams, and Marty went up there and, and, uh, and exchanged a lot of ideas, uh, both with, uh, with Brian and with the students, to go back to the transportation thing. 
Roads aren't that good. <coughs> uh, there are no buses running between Alto Pass and Carbondale. Uh, so one of the things that, that they're looking at is setting up a, uh, an organization, a volunteer organization of folks who can bring the people some of the VSOs bring the people to the, the hospital, but they're looking to expand that to getting people into Carbondale uh, to see the folks. Uh, Marty's done three intake clinics, again with some assistance from, uh, from John Marshall. Uh, they have established uh, a volunteer group, core group of volunteers to help with the, uh, the legal assistance sort of things that they don't do. Their primary focus is on benefits. But, um, and they have also, this is, this is one of my favorites, uh, set up a intake clinic in cooperation with a local organization called This Able Veteran. And This Able Veteran provides service dogs to, uh, to the vets. So they've done an intake clinic there. Uh, uh, Brian admits he's never done anything with uh, service animals uh, other than pet them when they come in with the vets. Uh, so uh, that's going out real well. A couple of things have happened in Illinois that, that have sort of enhanced this relationship as it continues to grow. Um, the first one is that in 2016, uh, two minutes, okay, uh, <laughs> mandating that every county in Illinois have a veterans treatment court or have uh, access to a veterans treatment court. Uh, Brian has been working with the uh, Cook County uh, system in uh, several, uh, for several years, of course. Marty's folks are working very, in fact, I believe it's been stood up in Williamson County, uh, which is the Carbondale County, but uh, uh, they have people who are communicating with uh, other counties, both through the 15 and the southern part, and, uh, and edging their way north a little bit. So hopefully uh, because uh, SIU is there and, the, and they're getting good response from the courts with some input from, from John Marshall, uh, that looks to be a, a very successful program and um, uh, we'll keep you uh, up to date on that. But uh, I'm not, what, what are those? What any requirement in West Virginia with the veterans courts or? Uh, we have two veterans courts in West Virginia, and we also have developed the one with the Northern District. We okay. do petty, we, yeah, petty offenses um, and misdemeanors. Very good. Okay. Um, the other thing is the Illinois Armed Forces Legal Aid Network. Now you have Chicago up here, you got Carbondale down here, you got all this corn country here in between, from Effingham to Peoria. Uh, John Marshall and Southern were both instrumental in getting this thing set up. They were part of the Let's Make It Work program as this thing has come into, uh, into, into business. It's been working now since last November. Marty advised me to have, you know, you have the <coughs> usual bumps and, and things. But now any veteran in the state of Illinois or his spouse can pick up a phone, call this, and be referred to uh, uh, an attorney somewhere in the state from Springfield, Decatur, Alton, Rock Island, uh, Terre Haute's in Indiana. So, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> Danville, well, there you go. So uh, their involvement in this, it gives them something to expand for. Uh, they're working with uh, the Southern folks and so forth. So um, it's a beginning of, Marshall just continues to grow and, and do well, and Marty's bringing his folks along. And as a Southern Illinois veteran, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. I, um, I lost one classmate in Vietnam about eight months after graduation. I lost a dear friend to an Agent Orange-related cancer about a year and a half ago. Uh, and I got a couple of buddies who are finally beyond the alcohol. Um, problems that came with it. Uh, Dave Holkamp was just a great high school running back and he's been gimping around now for about 50 years. So um, uh, I, I really appreciate it and, and we are happy to help in any way we can and we'll go, go from there. So uh, there's a question at the end of the, uh, the, end of the session, but I think 
take these ideas that, that Brian and Marty have, have put out there and see what you can do to, uh, I'm sure Jen will let you do anything you want. So. <laughs> <laughs> that is my hey, It's all good. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thanks. Do you want me to do the, the, uh, the ethics thing now? Or? We'll do it at the, you want to do it at the end if we have Let's time? Let's do it at the end, sure. All right. Both of these guys are trying to make us cry up here, uh, Jim and Dave, thanks. Well, here's the, here's the good part of the program. We've, we've heard from the Marines, we've heard from the sailor, and we're moving in the right direction because we have an Air Force veteran next, okay? Uh, at least moving in the right direction for me. So Kim Adams is going to come up here and speak next. She serves as a veterans legal advocate for community legal aid services in Akron, Ohio. Um, she uh, received her JD from Wayne State and I think was elected uh, as an Equal Justice Works fellow while at 3L, right? And it yes. was your first job? Yes. Yeah. And I'm still there. So you're still there because she created a, this amazing project called Boots on the Ground Veterans Justice Project. And my understanding, Kim, is that uh, they've picked it up and, and run with it since then. Yeah, we've been, we've been working with it ever since. Yeah, amazing. And she's going to, I hope, tell us a little bit about yeah. that. Um, she, all, she serves as a com committee member of the Veterans Administration Research Advisory Committee on Gulf War Veterans Illnesses. She's also a member of the Stark County Bar Association Military and Veterans Affairs Committee, Rebuilding Together Stark County Advisory Council, and the Stark County Veterans Task Force on Homelessness. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. <laughs> I was too old when I um, flunked out of college three times to uh, go to the Marines because I wasn't going to let nobody build me down and bring me back up. Because <laughs> I was 25 and I had already played the sorority too, so that was done. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so my, my aunt was a drill sergeant in the Army, and she said, Kim, go to the Air Force. And my dad was <laughs> So I work for Community Legal Aid Services. We are, you know, a counterpart of, of West Virginia Legal Aid, and um, they are very committed to our work with veterans. So I'm going to talk a little bit about civil legal challenges for veterans, because with the discard upgrade issue, there's also <coughs> issues with civil legal problems, and a lot of people don't associate. A, they don't know what a civil legal problem is. They just don't know what it is. So if they're getting kicked out of their house, they're like, I'm getting evicted. I don't know where to go, that's when we come into play. Foreclosures, that kind of stuff. So, let's see, let me see if I'm smart. Here we go. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Just our veterans legal team, which morphed out of my um, Equal Justice Works project, what we do to um, empower Central, East, Central Eastern Ohio, you know, veterans and their families, because we don't just work with the veteran. If a veteran passes away, we can work with their family member. It's according to what the grant, our grant covers. So we have grants that cover veterans only, and then our whole organization, if somebody calls, we always ask, are they a veteran or do they have a veteran in the household? We can also help with them. There's special challenges dealing with rural veterans, as um, Jim and Dave talked about. In Ohio, we have rural counties. We literally do. Columbiana County borders Pennsylvania and West Virginia. We serve as Columbiana County. So that's where it's East Liverpool. But it serves those areas and the problems that we have are jurisdictional. Because we can't, cover, we can't help them, but we can try to refer them. Our big deal with outreach and what the relationship is between veterans and their <coughs> advocates. And that's a little bit of ethics stuff. I won't talk a lot because I know Dave's going to talk about it later. I had to give love to Ohio State. <laughs> <laughs> but this, a little bit, this is a little bit about our veteran population in Ohio and our, our counties. Um, Ohio was ranked sixth in the nation with veterans. Summit and Stark counties, which encompass Akron and Canton, I'm from Canton, um, are fifth and sixth in Ohio with veterans populations. And our rural counties are Wayne and Columbiana, and I got these statistics from um, the VA, um, some from the VA. So who we are? Community Legal Aid is a nonprofit law firm, and this we help we help low income clients navigate complex legal problems. Um, and we advocate for those rights, but the one thing that our team tries to do is we try to empower folks. We don't want you, we don't want you coming back. You know, we, we don't. I mean, it's good if you do, you know, but when I went to law school, the one thing that I thought about was that I don't want to be the one standing up and always advocating for you. When you are done working with me, I want you to be able to advocate for yourself. I want to empower you to understand what's going on and what you can do to try to help yourself further down the line. And our firm does that too. So we need to be advocates 
and we need to be empowering people. Because that, that is a big thing. Because you, if you have people come in to talk to you, okay, they're already, the thing that they like to say about veterans, especially those with PTSD, is that they're damaged. They're not damaged, they're broken. They're just broken. People who deal with civil legal issues and a low income are broken. They're broken because of the system, and they're broken because they don't know what to do. And our job is to try to help them put the pieces together to fix themselves and move on. And then what we also do is we collaborate. And that's what I like to do, and that's what I do. You know, I, I like going to Social Security hearings. They're great. I'd rather be out here doing this kind of stuff. I hate being at my desk. So this is me and Kenny. It's Kim and Kenny. Kim and Kenny show. <laughs> we are the Veterans Legal Team plus all of our colleagues. So we go out and do a lot of work. Um, this was our first stand down we did in 2013. And we've been going and doing all this stuff ever since. But Kenny don't like to come out in public. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm seeing emails on my phone from Kenny. <laughs> what do we do? So these are, the, these are all the civil legal issues we help folks with in one way or another. The good thing about our law firm is that if we can't help you, because like all nonprofits, we run on grants and we run on money. And if we don't have grants and if we don't have the money, we also have a volunteer legal services program pro bono, like Jim and um, Dave. We have attorneys that can help folks with cases that are outside of our acceptance because we don't have funds or because we just don't have enough people to do them. So this is, these are civil legal issues. These are the things that a lot of people just don't know. They, don't, they can't classify. The challenges, there's three. For me, there's three. The distance issue and transportation. From the furthest point in Columbiana County to the Byzantine Center, which is in Cleveland, it is almost 200 miles. But there's a, there's a clinic, there's an outpatient clinic, probably, I think, 30 or 40 miles from East Liverpool. But you can't get diagnostic services at that outpatient clinic. For us to do a legal clinic there, I have to drive two and a half hours. But we also have a satellite office there. So the distance thing is a big deal for people to be able to get from point A to point B. And when they can't do that, they don't know what's going on. They don't have anybody. They, they hear the rumor. Well, if you, if you pay this, then you might be able to keep your house. Well, if you don't pay it in time, you might not be able to keep your house. But if you don't pay your rent because they didn't repair your apartment, then you can, they'll just let you stay. Not if you don't escrow it. So if you don't know the procedures because you don't have access to people to try to help you, that is a problem. I explained it like the border and jurisdiction issue. That's a huge problem for us when we go do our legal clinics because we actually have legal clinics and VA facilities. So we do our clinics a lot of time and we have jurisdictional problems within Ohio because we only cover eight counties, but because our legal aid is the only legal aid that has vast clinics, we might have a clinic in, in Stark County, but we might have a veteran that comes all the way from Tuscarawas County. Therefore, we can't help them. We have to do an interagency referral, but they might not be able to help them either. You know, so there's a lot of, there's a lot of interplay with jurisdiction and interagency referrals. And the biggest one is the last one. Because if you're a veteran, you understand that you don't trust anybody, and you got a lot of pride. Because that's just what they teach us. You trust the people that are around you that are going to save you when something happens. And that just doesn't stay when you, you know, are in the military. That follows you straight out of the military into everything you do. And one of the good things about veterans that do this work is that we understand that concept. And that we know how to sometimes, we can say things to another veteran that a civilian can't. We can tell you that, like with veterans treatment courts, I work with three. It's like basic training. And you have to trust the process. You're going to fall. We're going to help you. But you have to always understand that it's not the same. It's the same as basic training where people are telling you what to do and sometimes it's coming at you 100 miles an hour. But you have to learn how to trust people to help you navigate 
at 100 miles an hour. And once you do that, and once you can get your client, your veteran client, to trust you, you will find out that they needed you all the time, and they'll find that out too. But if you can't get past the trust issue, you're wasting your time because they're not going to buy in. They will not buy in. You don't have to talk like a veteran. You don't have to do all that stuff. You know, you don't have to say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir, no. You just have to sometimes let them talk. Sometimes they have to get it out. Sometimes you have to just sit there and just not say anything. I have had a client where we sat in our first appointment and we didn't say anything for 20 minutes. Because I sat there and watched him navigate the whole building to figure out how he can get out. Because when you're dealing with clients that have PTSD, they <coughs> always have to know their way in and their way out. So you have to be very culturally competent to deal with veterans effectively as clients. And this is some of the outreach we do. We, do, we go into the VA, we do VA clinics. This is the World War II vet I met. At, um, Congressman Renacy had an outreach event. We have small veteran outreach events. So we go and we talk to them. You know, I just go to meet folks. I don't care about if they got a legal problem. I'm trying to meet everybody I can see. So I met him, but we have these legal clinics. Um, now they're monthly. We have one um, in Youngstown and Canton and in Akron. Uh, we also do clinics with our um, VSOs. Um, we actually did a fair housing clinic for veterans in Trumbull County last year. And now we partner with the um, IRS local taxpayer service. So now we have veteran specific tax clinics. We do them after when tax season, around we start them around April. I think this year we'll either start them in April or May. And we do these, they come. The reason why we're doing this is because one of the taxpayer advocates is a Marine. <laughs> <laughs> and he wanted to help. He wanted to find a way to help. And we have a tax attorney with our, um, our firm. And we're like, great. So we go out and we do these tax clinics. This is the biggest thing for me. You, the partnership. I can't want it more than you. This is a teamwork thing when, I, when we're working with veterans. In basic training, you never did it by yourself. If you did, you didn't graduate. You got washed out. They have to see you as a part of their team, and you have to see them as a part of your team. At the beginning of the relationship, you might be doing some extra things because they're broken, because they don't know. But as you progress in that relationship, they have to take more responsibility. At the end of that relationship, they should want everything more than you. If they do, you've done a good job. If they haven't, you're going to have back. You're going to have slips. Trust me when I tell you. When I had a client that I had to tell to get out of my office, and he was a veteran, I had to tell him to get out because he got up and he thought he thought he was going to raise up on me, literally. And I was like, you know what? If you do, we're going to have a problem. But if you go over there and you sit down and you think about it, after you think about it, I need you to get the hell out of my office. That's exactly what I told them. We are the best of friends today. I would do anything for them. But there are some times when they have to know that we didn't cause the problem. And that was one of those days. That he thought that we caused the problem and made him raise up to his landlord. And he ended up getting a menacing charge. And he ended up getting kicked out. So we got, him in we got him in treatment because that's what the collaborations are about. That's what the partnership is about. But you have to, they have to have buy-in for that, and then we can be more effective at what we do for them. That's me. Forget the picture. <laughs> in the Air Force, this is when I was in law school. Um, all of these folks are my good friends. Um, I think she is now major. Um, Teresita Burks. She's um, Marine Corps JAG, and um, my classmate in the middle, um, her husband, was in um, uh, the Gulf War. I was in Persian Gulf. I went at the beginning, when, at, at, the, at the beginning. <laughs> but yeah, that's when you, in the Air Force, you graduate rope school, you get these little ropes, and they supposedly think you're a leader or something, <laughs> when you know nothing. <laughs> so that's my contact information. Um, 
like I said, my big thing is outreach and empowering folks, and, and the rest of it kind of falls into place. And we're also on social media because one thing you need to remember about outreach is people, they access social media. We are surprised that we have a Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram. We get requests for services on Facebook in our messages. And I actually follow up with them to see. So you have to be creative on how you reach folks. You might think a rural veteran don't have access to the internet. You're sadly mistaken. <laughs> you know, they can go to the library. They can find ways. It's up to us to figure out how we can help. We have to be more flexible. We have to be willing to go out and talk to folks. We can't just stay in our little shells and, and figure a veteran can get up here to Morgantown. Sometimes we have to get buses. When I was an Equal Justice Works fellow, there's an there's a, uh, organization called One Justice, I think. They take a big bus of pro bono attorneys out to God knows where in California to help immigrant populations with um, so you know. That, help, that helps them with, with um, environmental issues. We have to go to where our people are sometimes. And that's how you build trust too, because they know you're willing to step out of your comfort zone to find out who they are and what they're dealing with. <laughs> well, the overtime that the engine was like, move courts, you would have pushed the thing in. <laughs> 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 Kim, let me just say that um, you would have told me to get the hell out of your office. I would have needed an adult diaper. Um, my colleague, my uh, colleague saw it. <laughs> they said they never thought I was mean. <laughs> it's only one time. Hopefully that never happens. I happened was both again. motivated and terrified there. No. <laughs> but I like. Uh -uh. Next, we're going to Texas. Texas. All right, next, Texas. We, got two, we got two ladies from Texas who are here with us today. We're going to start out with uh, Lynn Rodriguez. And Lynn, I'm so happy Lynn's here today. Um, and she's one of the first uh, people I met when I first started doing this. I was called the ladies of Texas A&M, some of my best buddies, because they I was sitting at a little table by myself. And they know this is true. They came up and sat by me and like became my, my buddies when I first started doing this. So thanks for traveling here. Lynn's... Um, serves as a, a, the law clinic attorney and clinical supervisor for the Veterans Project and the Family Law and Benefits Clinic at Texas A&M. And she's amazing and is also willing to share her family law knowledge with you uh, for veterans and has done that for us here. She's absolutely fantastic. Um, you've been with the project two years, Lynn? Yes. Is that right? Okay. So she assists, assists vet veterans also much like him with civil legal issues. Um, and she also does some VA benefits work. Do you do? Okay. Lynn's a board member of the Tarrant County Veterans Coalition in Fort Worth, Texas, and a board member of the Tarrant County Chapter of Texas Lawyers for Texas Veterans. And you guys gave me, remember you gave me that big box that... Uh, oh, that's, it was a, was it the clinic in the box? Yeah. The they gave this big box. Yeah. The I got thing, one, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, not only I sat with them, they came out of nowhere and brought me this huge bankers box. And it's, yes. it's uh, what did you guys call it? Uh, no, it's just the, it's the clinic, clinic in a box. Clinic in a box. I got one of those on my desk. And it was so oh, heavy. I shipped it back yep. to West Virginia. I went to UPS <laughs> and shipped that thing. But uh, it was amazing. You guys yep. really do great work in Tarrant County. So, Lynn, come on up here and um, regale these folks. Linda Reagan. Do, do you have something else to speak for now? Just the, uh, yeah, I have a little PowerPoint there. There you go. Right. This one. Oh no, that one's mine. That's my flash drive with all those pictures. I got it. Yes, that's a, that has to be mine. This is Texas. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> y'all got to hear a lot about Texas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know how this works, so you tell me which one. Four thousand. Oh, there you go. I'll still get them on. <laughs> so I'm Lynn with Texas A&M. I'm the, a clinical supervisor and a law clinic attorney. Um, I'm calling my little portion assisting rural veterans in a large state. Some challenges and some solutions. I wish I had. Like, all the solutions would be the title of my presentation, but that's not it. Texas, how big? Well, I'm going to give you a little geography lesson just so that you can understand what we're dealing with, with uh, Professor Fonsellier and I are dealing with. The land area of the state of Texas is 261,000 plus square miles. And out of that 261,000 plus square miles, we have 254 counties. And out of those 254 counties, 
We have 172 counties that are classified by the Texas Health and Human Services Department as rural. So let's do the math. I can't. I'm a lawyer. <laughs> right. I would figure out that's more than half. Right? <laughs> so, but here's the, the good and the sad part. There are only 25 bar associations and other organizations that have legal, veterans legal services, and such as Texas Lawyers for Texas Veterans, which I'm part of. But these organizations and the bars are mostly in urban areas. Okay, we have all you know. We have a ton of bar associations. Okay, we have a bar association for everything. Bar association for lawyers with brown shoes. I mean, we have <laughs> literally any kind of bar association. But the bar associations that help veterans, there are only 25 of them. Okay. The number of veterans living in Texas, there are approximately 1.5 million veterans living in Texas. We're second to California. In North Texas, there are approximately 456 plus thousand uh, veterans. And I'm going to be talking about the North Texas area. Okay? I'm not going to talk about ce Central Texas because that was Professor Fusilier's uh, place. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've got all of Central Texas. <laughs> However, you know, even in urban counties, the miles between cities can be a really horrible barrier to veterans to getting any kind of legal service, um, homelessness services through Catholic charities and such, um, and medical services. So how many counties make up Central North Texas and how many are rural? Well, the yellow portion is where I'm talking about. Um, Central North Texas has about 16 uh, counties. And out of those 16 counties, only three are classified as rural. But if you add the additional 14, which we're like, should they be part of us? The additional 14, you're adding another 10 rural counties. So that means out of approximately 30 counties, 13 of them are rural. But don't let that fool you. Because even in the urban areas, you would swear they were rural. I'm not joking. So um, North Texas is approximately 10,000 square miles. So what legal services are available to veterans in North Texas? Well, you have Texas A&M. You have Legal Aid of Northwest Texas and Dallas. You have a, a Southern Methodist University, which I left off maybe on purpose. But, <laughs> but they help also uh, in the clinic. And all of these providers assist veterans with legal, with family law issues, landlord tenant, we do probate, real estate, other legal issues. We're going to start a criminal clinic, uh, criminal law clinic this fall. So we'll be doing probably some misdemeanors, which of course, you know, we have a lot of homeless veterans who get what, like loitering, mm -hmm. and sometimes they're driving without a license, you know, if they, if they have a car. And I'm talking about homeless veterans because obviously, they had a car, they wouldn't honestly feel homeless. Because I've met a lot of veterans at the VA Resource Center on Lancaster in downtown Fort Worth that have lived in their car and they will argue with me that they are not homeless. So, and that's true. We do occupational licenses to help some veterans be able to go to work lawfully. Um, we do expunctions and non-disclosures. It, that always means something different in different states. Expunctions is like you've never been convicted, but if you've been convicted or if you've pled out, you're going to be, you're a qualified for non-disclosure, or you get an expunction if you've been found not guilty. And then your trial uh, judge has to recommend you get that. Okay, it's sticky wicket in Texas. And we also do compensation and pension claims. Uh, we, uh, are beginning to do uh, discharge upgrades, which is, I found, Mr. Richardson, just fascinating because uh, it is, uh, it's a challenge, but I found that if we can assist a veteran in changing the narrative of their discharge, perhaps the VA might consider giving them some benefits. Perhaps the BCNR, uh, or the BCNR would consider you know, um, changing the narrative and who knows. 
I mean, I don't know anything. I'm still trying to learn this. Uh, we also help with a lot of non-legal issues. And I will give you an example of that. Recently, a veteran came to us to talk to us about um, I was assisting him with a notice of disagreement. That's an appeal. When they get uh, an opinion they're not really happy with, so they want to appeal it. Well, I can't help him. He's with a VSO. They're taking care of business over there and doing a really good job for him. But he said he brought his electric bill to us. And he said, uh, Mr. Rodriguez, can you help me with this? And I thought, at first he's going to ask me to pay it. I'm not good. <laughs> <laughs> and I really thought, <coughs> <laughs> because you just feel, right? You get the bills for your veteran. And um, I said, well, what happened? Well, he was a victim of slamming, mm -hmm. which means one uh, no-name electric company switched out his electric service with another no-name electric company. And they're kind of in cahoots, I think, because they switched them out one month before the end of his contract, which incurred a $250 um, cancellation fee. And so he was freaked out because that's a third of his, uh, his Social Security. And he was very scared that they were going to take his rent money. So I said, I need a client engagement letter. And so we signed it up. <laughs> and then I went to my computer and I went, stop that. And then, <laughs> out over two days, it was done. And in the meantime, my student was on the phone for an hour and a half with Bank of America canceling that auto draft. So if we were going to get the problem solved, at least they couldn't get his money, right? Then we'd be worried about his electric turning off and all that. Which we're just going to cross those, those barriers, those, those little things as we can. But that's what we do. We handle a lot of non-legal issues. So what are the challenges for our rural vets in North Texas? Sadly, we lack attorneys to take federal, these veterans' cases for no fee in rural areas because attorneys are just not living there, okay? And if they are, they have solo practices. And so you got to make a living, right? got to pay those loans. <laughs> okay? When an attorney is available in a rural area, Maybe that attorney doesn't practice the law that our veteran needs, right? And some urban attorneys do not want to practice in unfamiliar rural counties. We call it being hometown <laughs> in Texas. So they will only advise veterans. And the travel may also make taking the case too expensive business-wise for the urban lawyer. The travel to a law clinic or attorney in an urban area is sometimes difficult and really hard for older disabled mm -hmm. veterans in an urban area. Can you imagine what it's like to come from a rural area? I'm going to give you an example. Cleburne, Texas, which is in Johnson County, which is the south southern county just below Tarrant County, they have um, a 40, I think it's a 45 mile drive to the nearest VA center for health care. To go to Texas A&M is like an hour as well. So there's not like, everything's an hour, by the way. It seems like every time we're like, it'll take me about an hour to get there. I'm like, of course. <laughs> we don't even tell you. An hour, right? It's an hour. So what are some solutions to these problems? We need to mentor rural lawyers into taking these legal issues. We gotta teach attorneys in rural areas how to conduct a, a law clinic. Texas Lawyers for Texas Veterans has something called a clinic in a box. Literally is a clinic in a box. We could set it up anywhere. We do yep. these clinics all over the place. So we can meet our, our veterans. We go there to them. Um, telephone advice clinics. I've been doing this a lot because a lot of my vets have the flu. And so we're like, why aren't you in a clinic? We call them because we're concerned. And they're like, <coughs> so we know why, right? <laughs> and so I said, well, what do you need? And so we go through everything and we advise them over the phone. And the State Bar of Texas has a Skype-like system that we use to put a uh, remote clinic on for our veterans uh, and who lack transportation. Sometimes they don't result in representation, but they really love the advice and that we cared enough to call them and to see them. What's the biggest problem for rural and urban? It comes down to transportation. We have a bunch of bus systems. None of them are connected to each other. It makes no sense, right? 
Um, there's literally no bus services in rural areas, and like I said, it takes forever to get anywhere. But Texas is big, as I started this conversation with. And how do you solve the transportation <coughs> problem, though? We have wonderful volunteers at Catholic Charities. We'll have a transportation service. The Tarrant Writers Network will come and, and uh, pick people up as long as they're in some type of uh, program with Catholic Charities. The city of Arlington, Texas, which is right between uh, Dallas and Fort Worth, which makes up the Metroplex, by the way, little trivia, the largest urban area or metropolitan area in Texas is uh, Dallas-Fort Worth. People were like, Dallas, uh, Fort Worth, uh, but together by the Metroplex. <laughs> yeah. um, we have my ride in both Dallas and Tarrant County. We take veterans to and from appointments. We have the uh, Veterans Coalition of Tarrant County, which I'm part of. We provide rights to veterans as well. Veterans providing rights for veterans. And we have the highly rural transportation grants that are available to organizations like VFW Post and such. So will help them pay to get cars to pay for gas to pick up veterans to take them to their appointments. You know, there are no really easy answers to solve the problems. Not in 10 minutes. I couldn't tell you. Let me give you a little bit, a little snippet. But what's apparent is that without volunteer um, attorneys, legal organizations, bar associations, volunteer rides for free or low cost transportation, there would be no access to justice for many of our uh, veterans. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of great volunteer lawyers and service providers who are always looking for a way to improve the condition of our veterans in Texas. And we can only try to do our best to serve those uh, to serve those who serve us, right? Before I go, I want to give you two short stories. My uncle Donald Cutlet is from West Virginia. I don't know where he's from in West Virginia, but he always talked about how much he loved West Virginia. So for me, this is a really personal journey. He suffered a terrible injury in Korea, left his fingers, shrapnel throughout his body. But he would surprise us. I'm from Los Angeles, California. And we had a pool. And one day we came home and he was at the bottom of the pool. And I said, is he dead? And no, he was just Uncle Donald. Just <laughs> pulled around. He <laughs> came out and he was loving and caring. And he took his life in 1972. It's really personal to me. I never served. But my daddy is a Korean War veteran. Uncle Donald's a Korean War veteran. My son-in-law is an active duty Air Force Master Sergeant who recently took my daughter and grandchildren to England. I'm going to cry about that one. <laughs> <laughs> Just left two weeks ago. Good place to be. Oh. But I've never been yeah, proud yeah. to, to serve veterans is my calling. I want you to feel a calling. I want you to have a client like my client James, who was a person who yelled at me and screamed at me, who repeated himself, but I would listen on the phone for two hours. My boss let me do that. Because James needed me. In the end, I would go to James and I held his hand as he was dying. My client, my students went and we wrote his will. We wrote a bunch of other things. We took care of them. We got him pension. He always felt like he was a nothing because he had a general discharge. Hmm. When he got his pension, the RO, the officer, the regional officer wrote the most beautiful letter when he granted him the pension. And he looked at me and he said, my father is proud of me. Serve veterans, students, when you become one. Oh, that's a very dramatic ending. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was dramatic. Ooh, tough act to follow. Uh, luckily, we have Big 12 rival. <laughs> oh, <excuse me. laughs> uh, Professor Bridget, you said say it like chandelier. Yeah, fusilier. Fusilier. I don't want to say very franche. It's very hard for me. <laughs> this is a fancy lady. I want you guys in the law review to listen up, okay? <laughs> I am not fancy. This woman is a professor of law, like I said, Big 12 rival Baylor. Um, <laughs>
where she teaches property law and other courses. And unbelievable, she could have sat there and done that. She's very fancy. She got her JD with honors from Baylor. Um, she was the editor in chief of the Law Review, um, <laughs> et cetera. But what did she do? She started the Veterans Clinic there. She didn't have to do that, all right? Where well, she's the executive director today. Okay, she's got tons of great service. I encourage you to read her resume. I know a ton of you guys are on the Law Review. You can see what you can do with your life, but it's a thrill to have you here from Texas. Um, Professor. Fusilier, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get that already. Do you want me to? So I'm going to talk a little bit about the Central Texas area and what we do and kind of the goals behind our clinic. I'm, I'm a civilian also. I never served in the military, but I was a military spouse the first two and a half years I was married. My husband was serving in the Air Force. So after he came back from South Korea, we got married, and I thought we were going to go someplace really fun and exciting, and they sent us to San Angelo, Texas, yeah. which I, I didn't even yep. know that that existed. And I was like, okay, I pulled out a map, and I was looking, 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 and I was like, it's past San Antonio. I've never been that far. Um, and it was, it was very flat and little bitty trees, and but it was a really great experience. And I, he was enlisted, not an officer, so we were with all the regular folk. And uh, it was really kind of eye-opening to see that the other people that he worked with, enlisted service members, once they had one child, they actually qualified for food stamps. And I'm thinking, wow, that is where you are when you're still active duty. What's your life going to look like when you leave? You know, wh where are you going to go? Um, have you been trained well enough to, to get another job? And when my husband actually got out, um, he was unemployed for 18 months after he got out of the military. Everybody gave great lip service to, oh, you served our country, but then when he wanted the job, he was either over overqualified or underqualified, and um, it was really frustrating. And uh, my, my dad served during Vietnam, my father-in-law during Korea, my grandfather World War II, as well as his brother during World War II. So the military has always been something very near and dear to our family. And I really wanted to take the opportunity to do something to give back. So there's the whole state of Texas, and the yellow rectangle is McLennan County, where Waco is. Um, which you've probably seen now on HGTV's Fixer Upper. <laughs> so now, now you know where we are, aside from the whole Branch Davidian fiasco in the 90s, um, on, a, on a brighter note. So McLean County in the middle, and then you see these other little counties in the close-up, Limestone Falls, Bell, Milam, Coriel, Bosque Hill. Those are surrounding counties that our clinic also serves. Um, Baylor Law School is small, kind of like y'all. We have 375 law students total enrollment. So we don't have a lot of students to draw on to assist us. And I was sharing with Lynn that I'm one of those people to, that I'm too stupid to know the answer is supposed to be no. I went to Baylor Law School as a student, and we didn't have any legal clinics, and I never really questioned it. And I came back to work there, and we still didn't have any legal clinics. But, um, oh, not there yet. Um, I went to a, a CLE seminar at the law school one day, and our bar president, Terry Tottenham, was there talking about the clinic in the box. That's when uh, Texas Lawyers for Texas Veterans was just getting started, and he talked about going around and having these legal clinics, and I thought, well, why can't I do that with law students? So I went and asked Dean Tobin, and I said, can I do this? And he said, well, if you can get risk management to approve it and you can find money, sure. So I did both, and we started it in 2012, and we've been, we've completed five years now, and it's been just a great program, and I, I love the fact that I have so many students involved, and they're really getting to make an impact. Because we do have a lot of rural areas in these counties around us. McLennan County is considered urban, but it's not really. I mean, it's one of those that Lynn was referencing. It's, it's urban, but if you look at some of the small towns that make up McLennan County, you don't really feel like you're in an urban setting. Um, Bell County is classified as urban, but it has Fort Hood there. Um, but it doesn't really have an urban feel to it either. Um, but Bosque County, which we serve, Falls County, Hill County, Limestone County, they are all definitely classified as rural counties. Um, this gives you the veterans population in each one of those counties. The giant veteran population in Bell County comes from the fact that Fort Hood is there and a lot of service members end up retiring and staying um, in the Central Texas area. Um, the total number of veterans that we've served out of our clinic from 2012 to 2018 is listed there. Um, you'll see the vast majority have come from McLennan County. 
um, and smaller numbers from all of our surrounding counties. We've only been able to serve 889 veterans in these five years, but I look at it as it's 889 people that otherwise wouldn't have had help. And we do have a limited reach and impact there at the law school, but my hope is for it to expand and get other people um, trying to do the same thing in their areas. So that way we can multiply that number. So what we do is we have a very streamlined system where we have law clinics the second Friday of every month. And so the only month of the year that we don't have it is August because we don't really have any students. We do go to school during the summer. We're a quarter system school, so we're year-round. But August is actually when everybody is pretty much gone. So that's our only month we don't have one. Um, we have it from 2 to 5 in the afternoon on these Fridays because we found that's the best time that attorneys can leave work early on a Friday afternoon. And um, that actually works pretty well for being able to assist veterans with transportation at that point of the day as well. So it's worked out to be a good time frame. We take appointments now because we've actually gotten so many people starting to come into our legal advice clinics. They were having to sit and wait. Mm -hmm. And one thing, we wanted to make sure that the veterans coming to our clinic know we're not like the VA. We're not like any other governmental entity. We're streamlined. There's not a bunch of red tape. Um, and you're going to get service quickly. So we mainly have appointments now, but we'll still take walk-ins if available. The way we do this to try to make sure that the law students get the biggest bang for their buck for their time, we break the appointments with the veterans down into essentially two components. The first, the law students go in and do client counseling. The law students go in, if we have a certain subject matter area that the veterans have reported, you know, I'm coming about a family law problem. I mean, they're not specific, but family law. I have questions about bankruptcy. We have some pre-prepared questionnaires that the law student can go in with and at least have some questions to start the conversation and elicit information that our volunteer attorneys will need to finish the process. But the students sit in there and sometimes it is just about listening. Um, they just sit there and they take a lot of notes. They might ask very few questions, but this person is there and thinks, oh my gosh, somebody's finally listening to what I have to say. Um, but they gather as much information as they can, try to identify what the legal issues may be or that there aren't legal issues. They come out, they consult with one of our volunteer attorneys who's there, and the law student and the attorney goes back in for the final consultation. So we're not practicing law without a license. The ultimate advice is given by a licensed attorney. But the law student has had some very direct and real contact with counseling a client and understanding that people don't come in with their problems packaged up with a nice tidy bow tied around them and says, this is what I need. They have no idea. They vomit words out all over the place, and you scoop it up and sort it out and figure it out. And it's, it's been really eye-opening, too, because we serve only low-income veterans because of our grants. Um, and I had a student one day who was sitting there doing the income intake, and he's like, can you come over here for a second? This is short. He said, I think this person's lying to us. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I'm, I'm putting in their income and assets. And he says that he only makes $600 a month. That's, that can't be real. And I said, Alan, he's here because he only makes $600 a month. And that was just a completely eye-opening <coughs> experience. He's like, people live on that? I was like, they don't live on that. That's why he has the problems that he has. And so it's, it's good to burst our bubble um, if we've not been exposed to what real poverty looks like. And then it also just makes me angry because I'm like, this is somebody who served our country and they're trying to get by on $600 a month. Um, which is a whole other issue for another day. But, um, after we do this in the legal advice clinic, we now do finally, thankfully, to the Texas Access to Justice Foundation, have enough money to where I have help. I actually have a full-time attorney that works with me now. He was actually one of my law students, one of our alums, and he came back to work there. And the week following the clinic, he goes back through and evaluates all the files, the attorney notes, and evaluates whether or not this is somebody who needs ongoing representation. We do take some of the cases for ongoing representation in-house, but we also have a great network of volunteer attorneys in McClinic County and the surrounding areas who will take cases on a pro bono basis for our veterans. As long as they income qualify through our program, we have malpractice insurance that will cover them um, for the cases. So that's one barrier that we've been able to eliminate. Um, and we started a pro bono challenge to try to get the little competitive juices flowing so maybe they can win the pro bono attorney of the year award or something. Um, so we always like awards and accolades, so just one more thing. Um, but we do also go by income eligibility guidelines uh, to receive services through our program. According to our grant, we can go up to 200% of the federal poverty level, which is amazingly low. Um, but 
at least we do get to go up to 200%. Most mm -hmm. legal aid programs are limited at 125%. Um, and so for veteran services, we do get, up, get to serve more people um, because the income criteria is a little bit higher. These are our primary types of civil issues that we deal with, kind of similar to what's been reflected already. Tons of family law issues, child support, um, custody, modification of visitation, things like that. Lots of family law disputes, divorces as well. Um, employment issues, um, some employment discrimination, um, harassment claims, lots of housing. Fortunately, I teach property, so yeah. landlord, tenant, and foreclosure yeah. are kind of my things that I champion. Uh, nothing gets me more worked up than a big bank trying to abuse somebody in the foreclosure process. I will take them on because they tick me off. Um, <laughs> I was told one time by a student that my quote on my evaluation, quote, my hate for Wells Fargo was a bit off-putting. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but I have no. reasons. I have reasons. Oh my. So I get a little worked up sometimes. Um, we get a lot of consumer issues, bankruptcy. Um, we do lots of probate, and we can actually do probate really well with our quarter system and the students that we have. We have wills clinics where we will prepare a basic will. Uh, powers of attorney, directives to physicians, uh, and give a, a veteran a complete package. We do one special day for Veterans Day where it's all focused on that, but throughout the year we do lots of estate planning and probate. We also work with veterans on occupational licenses, getting driver's licenses back. The only VA benefits that we touch are during our clinics. We are very fortunate to have a, an attorney in town who used to work for the VA. And now that he's retired, he wants to do something with his time, and so he comes to every single legal advice clinic that we have, and he's our resource for the veterans who come in who have questions about disability benefits, and he's just been a fantastic um, help to us. We do have referrals to private attorneys who are appropriate if it's not something we're capable of taking on in-house with our students, but um, Josh, our, our new director, tries to do as much at the law school as possible to give students the opportunity to work on the cases. So students have a variety of chances to get involved through the legal clinic itself, or even if they can't come to a clinic to work on one of the cases, or if they want to just do transactional work to work on wills for the veterans that come in. Challenges, making the veterans feel comfortable. Um, I did not want to have the legal clinics at the law school. That can be a little bit daunting and intimidating. It's a big building, you know, where do I go? So I did not want to have it there. Also didn't want to have it at the VA because a lot of people have a, a lot of bad feelings about the VA. So we kind of wanted to distance ourselves a bit, and also the VA was wanting the university to sign this hideous indemnity agreement mm -hmm. that they were never going to sign as well. Basically, if somebody came to the clinic and tripped and fell in the parking lot, the university was going to be responsible for that, and that wasn't going to happen. So um, <laughs> that just wasn't going to happen. So what we ended up doing, um, MHMR, <laughs> Mental Health and Mental Health Foundation. Um, Settle down, I, lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> you really started a I'm fire. Sorry, with that. that's, what they, that's what they wanted us to sign. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, I, I'm not in risk management. I'm just fact. <laughs> that's above my pay grade. But um, we were able to partner with MHMR, a local um, organization who has started the part of Texas Veterans Coalition to get all different service providers in the county together. Social services, um, um, the people that work with the VA, <coughs> services like us, and, and so we can cross-refer and coordinate. But they bought a 5,000 square foot building. Mm. And they have mm. the, um, slip ahead for a minute, the Veterans One Stop. So this 5,000 square foot building, they have all these offices, they have community gathering space, but they have um, drug rehabilitation counselors, other mental health counselors, um, people who are there with the veteran service office to help with disability benefits, um, all manner of service providers. And what they do is they give us office space once a month for our veterans clinic. They give us a conference room to work out of and four offices where we can have private consultations with the veterans. And so the veterans are coming to a location they're already comfortable with. It's somewhere they're coming, and they don't necessarily just come for our appointment. They might be able to get three or four things accomplished, and that helps with that transportation challenge. Um, because that was one of the other things, um, built, aside with building a reputation for quality service, but making it accessible, getting the word out, transportation issues, and easy to access location. And the Veterans One Stop really provided that for us. Getting the word out of all things Newspaper. Mm -hmm. A lot of the veterans that come in are older right. to our clinic, and they still read the newspaper. And so the first time we ran a newspaper ad, the, the Waco Trib actually made a mistake 
and accidentally put our ad in the sports section. Ooh. And we got tons, <laughs> tons of appointments. And so the next time we were like, you know what? Put it in the sports section again. <laughs> Not only was it cheaper, we got tons of appointments from that. So we do use social media to reach out to some of our younger veterans who use that, but we have a, a lot of our demographic is much older, and newspaper ads work really well. Um, so sometimes old school still works, mm -hmm. um, and so it, it can still be a viable tool. Um, but they give us these offices. Those are a couple of our students <coughs> who were having um, uh, the initial consultations with the veterans. They give us these, this office space to use, and it works really well. The One Stop also has uh, veterans who volunteer there who go and pick up the clients and bring them to us. So that assists with transportation because public transportation is basically non-existent in Waco, Texas. We used to have one taxi cab and they actually shut down. <laughs> so um, it is what it is. So we're working on some other avenues and also now that I have somebody working full time with me trying to do some going to them outreach. I told I want them, I want one of the Baylor buses and I want to call it the Justice Bus. Yes, sir. <laughs> and I, I want to travel around and take law students maybe on a Saturday morning, whatever. I know that sounds really appealing, but <laughs> big days are busy. But on a Saturday, advertise it in advance and pack up our stuff and go. Um, and get to those people who can't even, you know, get a ride to come in because otherwise they wouldn't have access to our service. So um, with having the additional help, it is really um, beneficial. So I'm, I'm now the executive director, so I don't have my hands in everything every day. I can actually go back to just teaching my students, but I can help with the big picture ideas, raising money through grants uh, to try to be able to provide more services. And Josh Borderud is our clinic director who works hands-on with the students day in and day out and supervises them. And so if there's anything that you would need or any questions you have, you can feel free to email either one of us and reach out to us. Uh, I have really enjoyed it. It has been very rewarding. And as I share with students all the time, um, at orientation I even talk to them about the importance of pro bono work. And there's nothing more satisfying than helping that person who, who their problem was for all intents and purposes on a legal standpoint, maybe something really small mm -hmm. that you can handle like that. But it's life changing for them. Right. It truly is life changing. Um, and on the days when you know you're stressed out and you're tired and you're thinking, I went to school to do this, you have those moments that you can reflect on and say, Yeah, but it's worth it because look what I can do. I truly am helping others and having a very direct impact on their life. So um, it's they are and they are all so grateful. Mm -hmm. Are there bumps in the road? Sure. Sure. I had somebody tear up the applications in my face <laughs> one time and throw them at me. <coughs> scooped it in the trash and 15 minutes later he came back and he said, as you can tell, I have some issues. Could, could we try this again? I was like, sure, here you go. And he stayed and he got help. But you just have to kind of roll with the punches on stuff like that. We're here to serve. So I hope y'all can have a lot of great opportunity and success in serving veterans and um, if there's anything I can do to help, feel free to ask. Thanks. We're going to do a Q&A, but I think we're done. Um, and if I don't let these guys go, they can't get to the next panel. But I literally have to let them out in like two minutes. You got it. The yes, two-minute warning. Okay. <laughs> There's a stack of papers on the back. It's an article by now Judge Allen of the Court of Appeals for Veterans Claim, and it's about ethics. And it's not it's not so much just your ethical things, but it's the sort of the way to, to deal with veterans in an ethical and, and – uh, a gentle fashion. It's basically four parts. Uh, the first part is competency. Now you all think you're going to, you, you all feel I'm going to be a competent lawyer, and you will be. But with veterans law, you got to stay in touch with what's going on. This, mm -hmm. so the VAIMA law just passed, the RAMP program, the direct program. You got to stay on top of that because I got a question the other day. Uh, the day before yesterday about what do I tell my father? He's had a, a claim at the regional office for five years. I think we're going to get an answer, but the service officer wants him to take the RAMP program. And, of course, if we're not successful with the RAMP program, then it all sits until February of 2019. And Dad may not make it to February of 2019. What do I do? Well, the conversation went on from there at length. but uh, So you got to stay current. Second thing. Communication. 
you got to be able to talk. You have to know the law so that you can talk to the people. And sometimes, as you've heard today from this great panel, you have to know the territory, to quote <laughs> the music man. Uh, you have to know what's going on in the service, what's going on in the world, what's going on at your local, what's going on at the Marion VA, at the Martinsburg VA. Try to, you have to stay with that. Then there's the third C is counseling. That's where you bring the competence and the communication together. Independent judgment, candid advice. And sometimes, as we talked about, you just have to sit there and listen. Uh, the amount of work that I've gotten done with paper shuffling while the, the phone is on and uh, the vet's yelling at me, I've, mm -hmm. I've got a few hours, a few things happen along that. I will say this, best phone call I ever had was when I had told a vet we couldn't take his case. I explained why. We had a 40-minute conversation. He called me back two weeks later and said, thank you for that advice. I, I, I said, well, why? I said, we didn't take your case. He said, I quit worrying about it. I took my granddaughter fishing. He was down in Texas. I took my <laughs> grandfather fishing, or my granddaughter fishing. We hit a school of crappie. My little, little girl pulled in about 30 fish in an hour, and that's the best day of my life because I wasn't worrying about the damn claim anymore. So sometimes that's where you gotta go with it. And finally, this one I added with, with Judge Allen's permission, compassion. And I don't have to talk about compassion to this group or that group out there. Put those four C's together, read the article, it's a little more intellectual than this presentation is. <laughs> but you will be just absolutely often awesome as Veterans Law Clinic. It's been a pleasure for me to be here. And again, Jen, thank you. And uh, send them on their way. All right. God Thanks bless. so much. Thank you, Dale. You guys can move. I need I need a